Well, happy Mother's Day, whether you're a mother physically or spiritually. We want to honor you this morning, and we are so grateful for you. I want to talk about a mother in Israel and share about the power of hope. Last week, I stood on Omaha Beach in Normandy, France, the site where in one 24-hour period, over 4,500 Allied troops died and what we know as D-Day. This event turned the tide on World War II. This military operation involved over 160,000 people and it took over two years in the making. And the United States entered the war after the attack on Pearl Harbor, December 8, 1941, but the plans weren't carried out until 1944 once everything was done. They had the foresight to see that even after years passed, an invasion would be needed to stop the onslaught of evil. And they had the hope to believe that victory lay on the other side of their brave sacrifice. My friend Kim and I were part of the inaugural group of women to walk through the Women of Valor Museum. And this is a museum that recognizes the contribution of women in World War II. The founder, Deborah, shared with deep conviction of why this has been her life's passion. No matter how small or large a woman played in the war, she wanted to make sure that every woman was remembered and their sacrifice was honored. Her husband, Mike, was our experienced and insightful guide throughout Normandy, and I asked him to share the significance of why in several places German structures and guns remain visibly prominent on the beach as the French and the United States flags waved in the background. He said this, because we remember what happened here. We remember that we were victorious. And now all summer long, families play on these beaches and the sound of children's laughter is heard as frisbees are thrown. Why do we do this, he said? Because we can. Despite insurmountable odds, they never lost hope and now they and we will never forget. How do we keep hope alive in the face of insurmountable odds? And what causes hope to go dormant or grow dim? Sometimes hope seems indulgent, yet another pregnancy test comes back negative. Or that business that we spent so much time and energy on fails. Or we've just grown weary from waiting or worn out from adversity. And we just don't think that we can risk any more disappointment. Or perhaps we put our hope in an object or an outcome and not in the author of our hope, who is Jesus Christ. And when things didn't turn out like we thought they should or like we planned, we realized that we had misplaced our hope all along. No matter what the circumstances of our lives, hope becomes too great a risk and it's too painful a process when we forget what God has done in us and for us, how he has led us, how he's intervened for us, how he's delivered us, how he's provided for us and walked with us. And the story of the Israelites throughout the Old Testament shows us that we are not alone in this struggle. God constantly intervened for the Israelites and he delivered them, he provided for them, he intervened for them, he walked with them. And yet soon after Joshua died, they forgot. They did not remember the miraculous events that had brought them to their promised land or the covenant with God that he had established with them, that they were united to him as his people. And this led to the time of the judges and a great apostasy in Israel. The nation underwent political and religious turmoil as the people tried to possess the land, the parts of the land that they had not yet fully conquered. Even the tribes began to fight amongst themselves. It was a very painful time in Israel's history. And we see throughout the book of Judges this pattern of behavior, which is clear. The people rebel through idolatry and disbelief, and then God brings judgment through a foreign oppressor, and then he raises up a deliverer or a judge and a leader, and the people repent and turn back to God. And when the people fall back into sin, the cycle of disobedience and deliverance starts all over again. Well, the hope in the message of Judges is that God will not allow sin to go unpunished. 
See, even though we often forget what God has done for us, God does not forget his covenant to us. And because of his great love for his people, he disciplined the Israelites so that they might return to him the same reason he disciplines his children today. He listened to their cries for mercy and he raised up leaders to deliver them. Yet even these godly men and women could not change the nation's direction and eventually God gave them a king. Well, I want us to camp in the book of Judges this morning. We're gonna look at Judges chapters four and five. So whether you have a paper Bible like I love or your smart device this morning, let's turn to Judges chapter four. We're gonna meet Deborah, who was one of the leaders in this time period that God raised up to awaken hope in God's people and to help them remember who they were. She did this because she remembered who God was. She remembered what he had done for them and what he had promised them. Her story, just like ours, takes place in community. Deborah, Barak, Jael, and the unnamed heroes of this military battle reveal a critical truth about hope. Hope tells God's story. See, we are called to become hope givers, to live in God's promises, and to tell God's story. Let's look at Judges chapters four, verse one through five. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord now that Ehud was dead. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan who reigned in Hazor. Immediately you see the word Again, this speaks to what we were just talking about, this cycle of disobedience, of God's people disobeying, rebelling, and God disciplining them out of his great love. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based in Harasheth Hagayim. Because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. Now Deborah, a prophet, wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at the time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. So we see a few things about Deborah in this passage. We see that she was a prophet. We see that she was the wife of Lapidoth, and scholars believe that could either be a person or the name of the town she was from. She was the leader of Israel at this time, and she was a judge that held court to handle disputes. And the victory song from Deborah that she and Barak sing in Judges chapter five tell us the deteriorated conditions in which the Israelites were living. Flip over to Judges five, verse six. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, and we'll read about her in just a moment, the highways were abandoned. Travelers took to winding paths. Villagers in Israel would not fight. They held back until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose a mother in Israel. God chose new leaders when war came to the city gates, but not a shield or a spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. This passage tells us that village life had ceased. When I was studying this, I thought back to those early days of COVID quarantine when the roads were abandoned. My son and I went to Florida. We even drove up to the Disney World gates and, and there were no cars on the highway, no one to be seen. It was eerie. It was, it was so out of the ordinary, so out of the norm of what we would imagine and expect. And yet we all lived through those days where it just seemed like everything stopped. So now we even have a context of what, just a, a fraction of what this would have been like for the Israelites. It, it said that they would not fight. They, God had chosen new leaders to fight, but they chose not to. They, they literally just had no fight left in them. Not a single weapon was seen among them. They were weary, they were defeated, they were terrified. This passage says they were cruelly oppressed for 20 years. 20 years. Hope lay dormant, and the once vivid memories of all God had done for them, delivering them into the promised land, now were only faded memories and reminders of a life that they no longer had. Until Deborah arose 
and she awakened hope, and hope tells God's story. Look what happened in verse 6. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh and Naphtali, and she said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River, and I will give him into your hands. Look at the confidence in which she says these words. Barak said to her, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Certainly I will go with you, she said, but because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours, but the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. There Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali, and 10,000 men went up under his command, and Deborah also went with him. Well, as we look at this story, we will see how we can awaken hope and live in God's promises. I love the power of hope. Even this week, I've needed this reminder. I've been sick. I've struggled with how I've been feeling physically, and it takes a toll on your mental state and your emotional state and even our spiritual state. But if we allow God to awaken hope in our hearts, then we can truly live in his promises. So I'm preaching the message that I needed to hear this morning. Well, hope refuses to be silenced by circumstance. We see here that the people have just come to accept, well, this is just the way it's always been. It's the way it's always going to be. And there's just nothing that we can do about it. There's a hopelessness that's settled in over the people. The circumstances were not ideal for Deborah to rally troops to a war, but she had had enough. She resolved that this was not going to continue on her watch. I imagine how weary she must have been day after day after gr day, growing tired, hearing their disputes, and seeing the pain of her people. And while she settled cases of all kinds, the people settled for less than God's promises. Village life ceased. Windows were boarded up. Celebrations were canceled. We know that feeling. The sound of music and children's laughter was no longer heard in the streets until Deborah arose. And hope needs someone to champion it. In Deborah, God found a woman who was willing to stand up and to fight for her people, for God's people, and let hope tell God's story. She grabbed a hold of hope. And although the text doesn't explicitly say that she prayed and she downloaded a plan from God, we can be sure of this because she was a prophet, she was their leader, and as such, she would have spent time with God. She would have heard from him and she would have been responsible for conveying his heart to the people. She prayed until she heard from God. I believe she would have never asked the people to step into this battle plan unless she was sure that God had told her. And she said to Barak, God has commanded you. Victory would not only require her participation, but the involvement of other key leaders and an unsuspecting hero that we'll meet in a moment. Well, there's more about the power of hope. Hope not only sees the challenge, it sees the call. See, our hope can become suffocated in the face of insurmountable odds. I stood there on Omaha Beach and I just thought about the insurmountable odds they were facing. And in spite of all the planning, so many things went wrong that day. And yet they were victorious. Men, women made choices to persevere in the face of insurmountable odds. They, they hoped that something would be different because of their obedience and their sacrifice. And we can become more fixated on the challenges in front of us than on the champion of heaven, Jesus Christ, who is the author of our hope. And he gives the authority to us as his sons and daughters to act, to move when he tells us to move. Deborah was fully aware of the challenges in front of her. She was not ignorant of it. And yet, she moved the people to act in faith. Look at Judges chapter 4, verse 12. When they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera summoned 
from Hasherath Hagahim to the Kishon River, all his men and 900 chariots fitted with iron. Then Deborah said to Barak, go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? Sisera led this massive army and 900 chariots fitted with iron. Still, she issued a call and she issued it with confidence. She summoned Barak and she charged him and the 10,000 men that he mustered together. She already told Barak, listen, the Lord is going to deliver Sisera into your hands. She prophetically declared victory and she instilled hope in the face of intense fear. She didn't just call him. She said, the Lord has commanded you. And I just wonder if we have this kind of confidence, if I have this kind of confidence in the Lord and what he calls me and commands me to do. Do we listen to godly counsel from our leaders? Barak is so brave in the face of what meant certain defeat in the natural. And Deborah is a hope restorer. She's a hope giver. And when we hear from God, when we have spent time with God, when we have settled in our heart what he's told us to do, when we know his heart, then he awakens hope within our hearts and then he empowers us to be a hope giver to others. Judge four, Judges 4 verse 14 continues, so Barak went down Mount Tabor, here he goes, with 10,000 men following him. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Harasheth Hagayim, and all Sisera's troops fell by the sword. Not a man was left. At Barak's advance, he pursued them. And I want you to notice something. Every single hero in our story is proactive. They don't wait for the battle to come to them. They go to the battle in faith because they know that hope rescues and hope delivers and hope tells God's story. Look again at their song of victory that we mentioned in Judges chapter five, recounting what happened in this battle. Verse four says, when you Lord went out from Seir, when you marched from the land of Edom, the earth shook, the heavens poured, and the clouds poured down water. The mountains quaked before the Lord, the one of Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. See, God caused a storm and an earthquake. It was, it was pouring rain and the enemy's horses and chariots, the very thing they thought was gonna be their deliverance became so heavy, weighted with iron that it sunk in the mud and they were defeated. Look at the language in these two chapters in Judges. It says, when you, Lord, went out, the Lord routed them. The Lord fought for them. The Lord gave the plan. The Lord executed the plan. But listen, we have to cooperate with what God is doing if we wanna see victory in our lives and in the lives of others. The miraculous happens when God's plan of action is met by our faith in action. See, hope tells God's story. Strength comes from God. Rescue comes from God. It doesn't come from us. It doesn't come from man's strength. It doesn't come from 900 chariots or even our best strategies. Rescue, divinely needed intervention comes from God. And God is working in community. I love this part of the story. God is hearing the cries of his people and Deborah is hearing from God and she begins to awaken hope, instilling hope and bringing hope to others. See, hope just isn't for us. It is for everyone. Listen to Deborah's heart as a leader for her people in Judges chapter five. Her heart was with the people. This shows the value she had for community. Verse two says, when the princes in Israel take the lead, when the people willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. That's her response to that obedience. Hear this, you kings. Listen, you rulers. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will praise the Lord, the God of Israel, in song. My heart 
is with Israel's princes, with the willing volunteers among the people. Praise the Lord. As hope awakens in the heart of the people, their faith is moved to action. And when the princes take the lead, she says, when they are willing volunteers among the people, goodness, there's so much in this passage that we could preach here. But what I want us to see is when despondency and disappointment turns to hope, when we remember what God has done, we remember who we are in Christ and who God is, what he's able to do when we trust him. Then we take the lead and we give God our yes. And three times in this passage, she says, praise the Lord because hope tells God's story. This is so amazing to see people awakened in faith. They have been so discouraged. Remember, no one's in the street. There's no sound of laughter. There's no music. There's no nothing. They have been cruelly oppressed for 20 years. And yet because hope is beginning to arise and awaken in their spirits, praise is erupting because of it. Faith is rising up to lead the fight against the enemy. And the same thing, guys, happens in our lives. When we act in obedience, we will see victory on the other side of our obedience. Will the battles be easy? No. In the middle of all these lists of details in Judges chapter 5 that Deborah gives about the battle, I find it interesting that she makes this statement, March on my soul, be strong. It's like in the middle of the flurry of all this battle activity, she just declares, march on my soul, be strong. And let me pause and just be a hope giver this morning. Some of us are battle weary. Some of us have stopped seeking God for the battle plan. Some of us are afraid to get in the fight. And some of us are just not sure We can completely trust God, especially if we don't get the outcome that we're praying for. But I want us to hear Deborah's words to our hearts this morning. March on, my soul, be strong. March on, don't stop, don't quit, don't give up. Don't give up on what God wants to do in your life. If your hope has been misplaced, that's okay. Just acknowledge it this morning. Don't live condemned. But if you recognize that you've tethered your hope to a particular outcome, I've done that before. And when God has illuminated that to me, I've just repented and said, God, would you help to reorient my hope to be anchored firmly in you? We have to anchor our soul in God alone. This is the God who loves us and saves us and delivers us and rescues and restores and heals and provides and forgives and I could go on and on and on. We have to remember who he is. Hope remembers who God is. It remembers what he has done. It remembers what he has promised. That's what enables us to say, march on my soul, be strong. Not in our strength, but in God's strength. Ephesians 6 tells us, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God so that when the enemy comes, and he will, that you will be strong enough to fight against the enemy's schemes. We will download the victory plan from God. We will be victorious when we act in obedience. Well, let's look at the back half of this story, how it concludes. The troops have been miraculously defeated, but Sisera escaped on foot. And if you think back, Deborah prophesied that he would be delivered. So even though part of the battle is won, not everything that God has promised has been accomplished. Do you hear me this morning? Some of us quit the battle halfway through. We had a taste of victory. You know, we think to ourselves, well, things are better than they were. But just like the Israelites, when we do that, we settle We settle for less than God's best. We settle for less than God's promises to us. And the battle wasn't completely won yet the way he had promised until the enemy was defeated and completely powerless, including Sisera, against them. We've seen the heroic actions of Deborah and Barak and the princes of Israel, 
but the final victory belongs to Jael. Look back at chapter four, verse 17. Sisera thinks he's escaped alone to an ally and he unsuspectingly finds a family that is loyal to both sides. And I wanna read all of verses 17 through 24. It reads like an epic moment from a Hollywood film. So read it with those eyes this morning. This really happened. This is the heroic, courageous faith of a single woman. Sisera, meanwhile, fled on foot to the tent of Jael. She was the wife of Heber the Kenite because there was an alliance between Jabin, king of Hazor, remember that's who Sisera works for, and the family of Heber the Kenite. Well, Jabel went out, Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, come my Lord, come right in, don't be afraid. So he entered her tent and she covered him with a blanket. I'm thirsty, he said, please give me some water. She opened up a skin of milk, gave him a drink and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. And if someone comes by and asks you if anyone's in there, just say no. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. And she drove the peg through his temple into the ground and he died. Just then Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you are looking for. So he went in with her and there lay Sisera with the tent peg through his temple, dead. On that day, God subdued, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan before the Israelites and the hand of the Israelites pressed harder and harder against Jabin, king of Canaan until they destroyed him. Wow, this woman, Jael, she is unbelievable. When not a single weapon could be seen among Israel, an unseen woman in an obscure tent was being prepared by God to act in extraordinary faith. Jael was the wife of Heber the Kenite, and there was this alliance between her family and Jabin the king of Canaan. So before Jael wielded a weapon, she wielded her influence. She was strategically positioned to invite the enemy in unsuspected, and again, she was proactive. She went out to meet him. When others wouldn't fight, when others wouldn't pick up a weapon, when village life ceased, Deborah, a mother, arose in Israel, and Jael, a behind the scenes courageous wife of a strategic leader, stepped up and stepped out. She went out to meet him. She took the initiative with the intent to aid the Israelites. She knew exactly what she was doing and what boldness and what strength and what faith in God in the face of insurmountable odds. She took a tent peg and a hammer and hope in her hands and she turned the tide on the war. Deborah and Jael had different roles and they had different responsibilities but God used them both. Deborah took the reins and Jael shared the reward. See, sometimes hope needs a hand. It doesn't matter if you're a leader riding into battle on the front lines or if you're a leader taking hope into your hands behind enemy lines. What matters is that we give God our yes and that we trust him to do the impossible with it. Be who God has called you to be. Do what God has called you to be and to do and march on my soul, be strong. Take hope into your hands. That's the power of hope. When we say yes, I will take it into my hands. Hope is not passive. Hope is active participation with God. It's the confidence that he will do his part. Faith is the hope, the evidence of what is not yet seen. We know that God will do his part. The obedience then that we have to do ours. Hope is not sitting on those spiritual weapons we find in Ephesians 6 and just asking for someone else to do our part. Hope tells God's story because we tell God's story. You are God's story on display. You're his mercy, 
you're his grace and his forgiveness and his protection and his goodness. You are his story on display. And we're not fighting with a tent peg and a hammer. At least I hope we're not because that's really weird and kind of scary. But we are fighting this morning with so many things. We're fighting with our prayers. We fight with our willingness to serve. We fight with our resilience in times of testing. We fight with our patient endurance in seasons of trial. We fight with our devotion to God's word as a non-negotiable in our life. We fight with our love for God's people and community. We fight with our trust in him to meet our obedience with his intervention. We fight with our determination to never quit or maybe this morning to restart if you feel like you're halfway through the battle and you've given up. Maybe for some of us, God is calling us to be a hope giver to others who feel too bruised, too broken, even to just pick up a weapon or dare to hope again. Because when we do, hope delivers peace. The end of chapter five tells us that the Israelites in that land had peace for 40 years, twice as long as they had been cruelly oppressed and experienced this deep despondency. Now they lived in the light of freedom and the promise of peace. They stopped settling and they started living. Isn't it about time that we do too? See, village life had ceased until a mother arose in Israel. The spirit of a mother who loved, who saw, who cast vision, who awakened hope and courage and instilled it in the hearts of her people. A city was alive again. Hope was alive again. Barak and Deborah and Jael issued a powerful challenge to us today. Look at this picture of restoration and renewal we see in Judges chapter 5. Look at all the action that's taking place now in this area. You who ride on white donkeys, sitting on your saddle blankets, you who walk along the road, not on the highways, not, not somewhere behind the scenes anymore, but they're out in the open. They're living life freely again in the light of hope. The voice of singers at the watering places, they recite the victories of the Lord, the victories of his villagers in Israel. Then the people of the Lord went down to the city gates. Wake up, wake up, Deborah, wake up. Wake up, break out in song, arise Barak, take captive your captives, son of Abinoam. That is God's heart to us today. Awake, daughters of God. Awake, daughters of the king. Awake, mothers with a mother's heart to see this culture awakened with hope once again. Awake, princes and leaders and men and fathers and brothers and sons. Awake, church of the living God. God, awake church of Jesus Christ. Where has life ceased for you? Where has hope gone dormant? What situation needs you to sing a song of victory over it? And when our hearts are too weary to sing, too fragile, God sings songs of deliverance over us because hope tells God's story. Hope always, always, always points to Jesus. Jesus is our deliverer. Guys, we can't even produce hope on our own. The Holy Spirit produces hope. And we have so many scriptures that tell us it is Christ in us. He is the hope of glory. We are in Christ and he is in us. That is where our hope comes from today. It doesn't matter what goes on around us. He is the source of our hope. Whether we are struggling or we are settling, the hope our souls need is Jesus. In Christ, the hope of glory, the hope of heaven, the hope of our soon coming king, the hope of no more sorrow or pain or tears or disappointment, the hope of all he is, 
the hope of all he promises, the hope of the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and empower us and strengthen us, equip us and encourage us. We will not escape battle in life. We are in a spiritual war, but we have the victory in Christ Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit and we'll be reminded through this passage, this story today, remember, remember what we were before Christ and know who now you are in him because hope tells God's story. You tell God's story. We are called to awaken, to rise up in our generation in our day, in this culture, and the challenges we're facing today. I don't have to list them, you know what they are. God is commanding us to awaken and to rise up and to not be silenced by circumstances, to see not only the challenge but the call, to put our hope firmly in who Jesus is, and to go, become hope givers, to tell God's story. Is there any place like the people that Deborah spoke to that we are holding back. Because before we can bring hope to anybody else, we have to let God awaken hope in us. And when we do, it turns the tide on the battle that we are facing. I needed hope this week, and I just put worship music on. I began to saturate my heart and my mind with worship, and it became loud in the voices of, of the way I was feeling physically or emotionally. And so, sometimes, guys, we just have to take hope in our hands. We cannot be passive. We are in a spiritual war. You have to rise up. You have to march on. March on our souls and be strong. When the object of our hope is in Jesus and not an outcome, we can only win. I wanna leave us with three closing questions that we can ask to let God awaken hope so that we can be a hope giver and so that we can live in God's promises. First, I want you to think back over everything we've talked about this morning. First, what is going on inside of us? And I'll make it personal. What's going on inside of you? And I ask that to say, where has hope died? Where has hope gone dark? Allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate and speak to that place in your life. Secondly, what's going on around us? Where is hope needed? Who needs you to be a hope giver in their life? What situation? Where can you speak life, speak hope, Use your gifts, your talents, step up, step out. Where can God use you? And finally, what's going on through us? What's going on through me? How does God wanna use you and me, all of us in community for kingdom purpose? It's going to take all of us. It's going to take all of us. If you're discouraged this morning, if hope has gone dark, if hope has grown dim, I want to encourage you. Let the Holy Spirit minister to your heart this morning. Take hope in your hands. Saturate yourself with worship, with who God is. Know that when we step out in obedience, he will give us the victory. Don't tether your hope to an outcome. Tether your hope to the author of the outcome, and that is Jesus Christ. And when we do, we can only win. I want to pray for us as we close. God, I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you awaken hope in us. I thank you that any place hope has gone dark, where it feels too indulgent to hope, where we've been too disappointed. I pray, God, that you would speak, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to, so personally to those very tender places this morning. I pray for mothers to arise in our generation. I pray for daughters to arise in our generation. I pray for sons to become princes, to get out from under anything that's holding them back in the name of Jesus. I pray for kings and leaders to arise. I pray for unsuspecting heroes who feel like they've been obscure or hidden or in anonymous places to know that God sees them, God desires to use them, and that all of us working in tandem in community will share the reward 
because hope tells your story. God, we, we want to tell your story. Let us be your story on display. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.